And um, thanks everyone for sticking it out today. Um, this talk is actually really fun for me to give because um, you know we collect a lot of data, we collect a lot of bird data. And this is not a data heavy presentation. We're going to look at some really cool movies that I think um, actually I'll show you all some footage, um, especially those of you that are interested in birds that you probably haven't seen before. And um, if you come back tomorrow at 1 o'clock, I will give you a data heavy presentation. Um, so it is out there. Um, but I'm just going to start. This is, um, I actually noted on here um, TWS 2014. I've given this, pre this is the third time I've given this now. I gave it for the Wildlife Society talks a few weeks ago in Bozeman. Um, it was fairly well received, though several of you in the audience today were at that talk too. So sorry you have to hear it again. But I also gave it to the Bitterroot Audubon Society two weeks ago now, and um, they just love this. So I know not all of you are super birdy, but just consider if you're in the bird world, some of the footage you'll see is pretty unique. So, and then thanks to my co-author Alan, which who is sitting in the back. Um, and this fits in really well with some of the talks we've heard today about the camera network. So I'll go kind of quickly through that since we've already heard a little bit about the networks before. Here's the ranch. I think we all know where it is now. Um, and here's the, um, the camera locations that Alan sent to me about what's going on at MPG Ranch proper. We also have the other network at MPG North. I wasn't able to incorporate that data into this talk for today, but just know there's a lot of information on birds from MPG North as well. Um, we use different cameras for different types of things, um, but you can see we have about 200 motion triggered cameras out there. Um, like Alan and Bo both mentioned, they're not necessarily randomly placed on the landscape. They're there to capture the things we want them to, ca excuse me, to capture. Here's kind of what a camera setup might look like. This is one in uh, sheep camp on a stock tank. As you know, the water sources on the property are popular places for birds and other wildlife to come to. So what do we use these for? Um, how many pictures of elk drinking do we really need? Um, well, we need them a lot, as you've heard for, um, from um, Alan. Um, you know, we can actually make meaningful, um, we can say meaningful things about even elk drinking. Um, we also connect our funder and the general public to the landscape via this camera network. You can go on the website, and I'm really excited to learn more about Bo's um, iPad app for looking at North stuff. Um, here's just a couple of the more practical applications that we can use this camera network for. Um, looking at things like documenting wildlife activity in and around our restoration projects. So this is an exclosure on the floodplain. Um, we want to see actually, I mean it looks like a pretty low fence to me that a deer can jump. Can the deer, are the deer getting in there or are they not? Here's a deer walking actually by our exclosure. Um, we can look at use of specific areas by wildlife over time. Alan, do you know the name of this bear? Anyone? Backflow bear. Backflow, okay, okay. We can detect wildlife in places that we really don't want to disturb. We don't people, want people in on the ground because we want things like moose and other wildlife to be there. Uh, we can document sick wildlife. We don't like to see this, but actually it's a really good record of when um, things like this occur. Um, we can look at who the troublemakers are. We've already kind of laughed at this, but um, who was disturbing the $5,000 Golden Eagle net launcher? Um, I don't know who it could be. The wild horse herd? I don't know. Yes, it was. Um, uh, we can look at things like phenology. I think Bo may be talking more about this. So the timing of events like when the snowshoe hairs change uh, their coat color. Uh, we can detect those infrequently um, encountered species and probably ones we don't want to run into in a, in a direct manner. Things like the mountain lions, the wolves, the famous wolverine, and then one of our most rare mammals in Montana, the western spotted skunk. And so the question as a bird researcher is how can we use these cameras um, to look at anything about birds? And uh, this is a really beautiful shot of a harrier. Um, I think this is over Tongue Creek, right? Or just right above the bench, maybe? I'm not sure where it is, but. Uh, we can look at them um, or use the cameras for really practical purposes like nest monitoring. So we've got the cams up on the osprey nest. We can follow everything about the life cycle of these birds, including from when they lay eggs to when they hatch, when the babies are doing cute things, which is most of the time. And then these birds have their satellite transmitters. We can check out after Rob and his crew capture them. Or how do the transmitters look? Are they looking okay? And do we need to go and, and fix anything? Um, we can look at unusual behavior like carcass-eating great horned owls. 
I think is pretty neat. And then we also sometimes get those unusual species. So now we have four people on staff full-time studying birds, and none of us have actually ever seen this bird in person. And it's shown up on cameras twice now. And I, I guess I'm willing to give away my chocolate bar for whoever can identify this, <laughs> this bird. Any guesses out there? No, but close. I guess I get to keep it. It's a mockingbird, and um, actually, Ellen, are, we've gotten it actually in a similar s spot in two different years, um, two different times of year, too, and that's just not a common bird in the Bitterroot. So did anyone actually get that? Should I? Okay. Okay, well, we can all just eat it later. Okay. The other great, th <laughs> the other great thing we can do is that occasionally we do get resightings, maybe like once or twice, but and this just happens to be one of uh, Raptor View's eagles, but... Um, it is good to see that these birds are out there. They come back months later after capturing and handling, and they look, they look just fine. And here's one of Adam's kestrels. Um, so we have a color band reciting here at one of our stock tanks. But now we're going to turn to water sources, because we have a lot of cameras set up on water, water sources, and we get a lot of bird activity at water sources. Robins are one of my favorite birds. They do really cute things at water. Um, but we actually get a lot of other unusual birds. Here's a beautiful picture of a heron. And these are birds you'd expect to be by water. This one you might not expect. This is a northern shrike bathing in one of those kind of ephemeral snow puddles that we had in, um, in November, probably pretty cold water. Um, and then this is really what triggered this talk, is um, getting these emails from Alan and some other of the folks processing the files. Kate, what is this? And then I'd immediately be like, Rob, what is this? Adam, what is this? Because we started to get a lot of these um, raptors showing up at some of our water sources. And some of these are from the occipiter group. So these are the forest hawks, ones we don't really see very often. They're hard to identify. And I really didn't like getting those emails from Alan or having that pressure of identification. But I mean, it happened enough that we were realizing, hey, something is going on here. And they are actually making great use of, of some of our water. So um, this is about as technical as I'll get today with the tables and numbers. Um, here's some of the species we've picked up at water sources. And this list I'm showing you both our hawks and owls. It includes most of our resident species, so the ones that breed. I mean, we, we don't really see like the harrier, some of them are opened. Um, open grassland species, but I think it's pretty amazing that a lot of the species we have we're picking up at these water sources, and some of them like the screech owl. We've never picked it up on our surveys. Um, Debbie did get it on acoustic monitor back in Davis Creek, but Alan has picked up a lot of footage of those um, just in his camera network. Um, so kind of what we're seeing here is that our raptors are frequently visiting the water resources, and especially if it appears that they're near breeding territory. Now, whether or not that animal is choosing the breeding territory because there's water there or what, um, we don't really know. Um, but some of the areas you'll see today um, from the footage I'll show you, I mean, they're used by a variety of species. So some areas are used a lot, and some areas aren't used very much at all. Um, I just have you keep in mind, there's no study design here. This is just kind of what we've gotten so far. And um, we've archived, or I've looked through the archive of imagery from natural water sources. So we're talking about like Davis Creek and some of our, you know, our streams and pools. Um, but the next thing we're going to start looking at is kind of their use of artificial water sources, since we have so many of those on the ranch. So here's some of the behaviors. I had some of the folks that were um, going through the imagery kind of classify behavior. And for come up our three kind of most common species that we're picking up, the goshawk, cooper's hawk, and great horned owl, um, you can see they're doing a lot of bathing and drinking. And again, a lot of us in this room have worked with these species, and I don't know if any of you have ever actually seen the goshawk bathing before. I mean, out of all the time we've been working with them. Um, you know, there's some behaviors that are inexplicable, and you'll see um, chewing on stick standing on rock, um, I mean, we don't really know what that is, it's just what the camera hap happened to capture. Um, but the great thing also about the, these cameras or what they're capturing is many other factors, including the time of day, the temperature, moon phase, um, season. So there are other species present we could analyze. There's lots of places we could go with this if we wanted. So I'm gonna just show you some highlights of some of the movies we've gotten. Um, the Cooper's Hawk, 
Yeah, and this has been kind of like a nemesis bird for us because we know they breed on the property. We know we have several territories. We've only ever found this one nest, which is where the, the star is. This is back in the boondocks. Here's the nest um, tree. I mean, they're hard to find. It's just a stick nest in there. Um, we found the nest in uh, 2011. We know they've been in there every year. We've never found the nest again. So they move their nests every year, kind of in a territory. But they all happen to be somewhat close to uh, one of Allen's camera stations. And um, when you had the camera set up there in 2012 and 2013, um, we picked up Cooper's Hawks at that camera um, 30, 30 times in the breeding season. So these birds aren't marked. We don't really know who's who. Um, but that's a lot of activity. And uh, so I'll just uh, kind of show you. Actually, we're just going to watch some cool movies. I won't narrate or, I don't know, talk like I'm a Cooper's hawk. <laughs> could I? I could also give the uh, chocolate bar to the person that does the best imitation of the behavior we're watching on screen. So if you feel like you need to get up and move around, I'm totally willing to part with my chocolate bar for that. This guy's drinking, walking around. Again, we don't really see these birds doing this. We're lucky if we see them fly over us or catch a shadow as you're walking through the forest. Or Sharon gets one in the mist net. You see the beautiful red eye in that one? It's the adult eye coloration. Yeah. Uh, okay, so take Bo's example because right now he's got the chocolate. <laughs> I like this rear bathing. Yeah. Anyone name the bird species singing in the background? No. Yeah. Swainson's. Okay. Yes. All right. This is another, to use Morgan's term, awesome movie. Um, this is a goshawk um, bathing when it's 24 degrees out. Um, you'll see this pool several times in these movies. It's just a really popular place. It's the trout pool. We get the bathing bears. We've got all sorts of things going on here. Um, we've never found a nest. Um, which is really troubling to me because I've spent a lot of time searching for goshawk nests. Um, but anyway, the, the, the frequency of activity of, of these adult goshawks suggests some places that we should focus some of our searching on. This is the biggest hawk in that exhibitor group. You'll see the adults have a nice white line on their head. We get a lot of this dinking around with vegetation. We don't really know what that means, but all the exhibitors seem to do it. I told Nick that if I played the sound effects, it would make everyone have to go to the bathroom at the end of the day here. <laughs> it's all burning water. Um, these great horned owls, it's, this is the same location as a lot of those um, goshawk movies. Got two owls in this picture.
I just never thought that some of these species would get in the water the way they seem to. I'm not sure this guy really loves being in the water, but he got in. Here's the chewing on stick. So this was interesting. When I showed this to um, Bitterroot Audubon, Judy Hoy was there. She's our local raptor rehabber. And she says her birds in rehab, all of the raptors chew on things constantly. So she always gives them sticks or, um, you know, just something to chew on. She was thinking maybe sharpening. Um. Here's the little gnome of the forest. This is one of my favorite owl species, um, the screech owl, western screech owl. This was a species we all felt had to be on the property and was likely back in Davis Creek, but we didn't pick it up. And Davis Creek is not very accessible in the wintertime, actually kind of like right about now when you would do your standard owl surveys, like calling and broadcasting, it's just not an easy place to get to. And um, gosh, Alan turned up a ton of footage of screech owls. Debbie got them on the acoustic monitors. And then actually when I was reprocessing some of the footage that, um, that had been cataloged, we actually picked up a screech owl in sheep camp. So we have them um, on some other parts of the property or more than we thought. Just not very common compared to the Sawet, which is kind of a ubiquitous little owl. It's like everywhere. These just aren't very common and or just aren't very, you know, people just don't encounter them very much. I think this is the one. It um, appears to have a fish. It's kind of an unusual um, behavior. Again, this is that same pool. So clearly this pool is great for birds, mammals. Um, sounds like tailed frogs, um, trout. go to our most uh, controversial movie. Now I'll say, Alan, this, you'll like this too. I, I opened this up to the audience at TWS in Audubon and everyone thought the long-eared owl was drowning the bull. When we released this on Facebook, there was just a lot of debate about intent. Um, so what's unusual about this, first of all, long-eared owls, like most owls, are primarily nocturnal. So this is one of, I think, one of the skunk cams um, in sheep camp and uh, um, captured some hunting during the day. And then actually just really quick catching two voles within a pretty short interval in water. That is a huge bowl. And it was alive when it went underwater? <laughs> I mean, he certainly looks like he knows what he's doing. And no longer alive. So the intentional drowning of a bowl would be a really neat, um, I mean, it's gonna be a, a neat note people can take with it what they will as far as if they believe in the intent. This is a new video at the TWS I went over time and wasn't able to show this one. So um, saw what else, again, one of our most common owl species. They're tiny, so we don't really run into them very much, but they're all over um, the ranch and um, super cute, super little. And they do seem to like um, hanging out at water sources. This is one of the best, I think. Um, again, feel free to imitate the head motion. These are young sawets. You'll see their, their coloration is different. They're really dark, kind of a chestnutty brown. And I think these are pretty recently fledged sawet owls.
Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine they're probably quite vulnerable at this point in their lives. Okay. So that's kind of um, some of just the, the use of our natural water sources. And I've been talking to a lot of people now, because like Bo was saying, you know, we have so much great footage. How can we make this? You know, how can we do something with it? And from the people that I've talked to, the bird biologists and other folks that have worked with these species, um, they see it as an incredibly valuable, even if it's a, a research note summarizing this stuff, um, just getting out kind of the frequency of detection, the behaviors, um, and that sort of thing. And we can certainly work in the future if we feel like we need to make it more rigorous or structured as far as a sampling protocol um, to do that. I'm just going to turn briefly because this is where um, I think we have some pretty big management implications um, when we do this documentation at water sources, and this is working with their use of artificial water sources. So we've got a lot of these on the property. We see lots of birds using them. And um, this movie kind of illustrates uh, one of the issues we have and what we've been working actually to fix on the property. So this is a, a stock tank in sheep, uh, actually in whaley draw. This happens to be one at this time that had about three inches of water on the bottom and that's it. This is a, a young red tail. This is in August of last year. So again, you know, like those sawets, you know, not the most graceful bird, not the most knowledgeable bird, and there's something in that tank. It could be a grasshopper, who knows what it is, um, that it's somewhat interested in. Okay, that pretty much illustrates that. The problem with that situation is if that bird would happen to fall in and get wet and stand, be in that three inches of water, does it have a chance of getting out again? So um, here's what the tank looked like just a couple weeks later. It actually didn't have the board in it at the time. Um, when we were doing that trapping, Lewis Young saw that and was like, oh my god, that's a death trap. So we put the board in, um, and you guys, just, just to give things um, a structure of some sort to get out, and that could be anything from a bat to a red tail, to a songbird, um, to a toad. Um, these um, cement stock tanks aren't so bad because they actually have quite a bit of texture to it that a, a creature could crawl up. The problem really are those metal tanks um, that are smooth surfaced. But um, we've been working really hard, Mike's been out there and some other folks putting in um, escape structures in our stock tanks. So if the water level is up and over the, the top or the lip of the tank, it's really not a big deal if the, if the bird or whatever falls in, it just can get to the side and get to the rim. But when the water levels are low is, is the problem. So you can kind of see here, the it's basically this hard wire mesh that you can get in any hardware store, I think. And um, that basically is a ramp up and out that anything could use. Um, here's an example of one in some of our um, metal tanks. So again, we had a problem here where one of our kestrels got in. It was a fledgling bird. Uh, there were hundreds of grasshoppers in the bottom, and that's what they're like, cool, food. It gets in there, there's a little bit of water, and uh, it, it's a goner. So um, we've worked really hard to try to get these escape structures into everything. And as you can imagine, there's hundreds if not thousands of these structures all across Bitterroot and western, eastern Montana, everywhere. Um, Bat Conservation International has put together this guide for ranchers and um, basically anyone on how to make your, your structures more wildlife friendly. So there are great resources out there um, so that we can keep everything safe, including things like this golden eagle. And um, I just like to close with a sign of spring, something else that we've picked up on our cameras. And actually, Alan's gotten a lot of these. Does anyone recognize this little guy? Berry thrush. OK, so they don't breed on the ranch. They are just passing through. And they just passed through kind of in mid-March. And uh, William and I heard two in woodchuck last week. Um, this is another, I think, really interesting application of these cameras, is to look at uh, specifically the passerines that are using these as they pass through during migration. So that would be a fairly easy analysis, um, and I think that's a place we could go in the future. So with that, you know, I thanked the people on here that got me the information I needed in actually a really quick amount of time, and I know there's probably other people in this room that have worked with the cameras and the infrastructure and processing. So thanks to everyone um, that has helped on that. And um, if you have any other thoughts or things you might want us to analyze, then um, feel free to chat.
Okay, I'll take any questions.